Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Focus on webinar. This month's presentation was pre-recorded at the ESHG conference in Vienna earlier this month, where we hosted our NIPT participants workshop alongside EMQN. So just a quick thank you very much to Emily and Abby at GenQA for helping us with the edit and the recording for this presentation. The question and answer session is included at the end of the presentation. However, we would encourage you to use the online questions box, which you'll see on your screen, to send us any questions that you may have today. We will then address the questions and provide our feedback before we make this presentation available on YouTube channel later this month. So now we'll share the presentation with you over NIPT participants workshop and we thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you Fiona and Veronica for setting us up. So um, welcome everyone, it gives us absolute great pleasure to welcome you to an EQA participants meeting. I think it's our first for three years face to face, so welcome and thank you for coming. Um, a couple of things just to say before we kick off with our two invited guest speakers and then our EQA panel for Q&A. Can you, can you complete the registration forms that are coming around us with your name and your email address? The reason for that is that we'd like to send you a participation certificate afterwards. Everybody likes a certificate to prove that they, they continue their CPD, so um, that helps us and it helps you as well. We are, as you'll see, um, um, recording the webinar today. We plan to also um, take note of the questions that may be submitted for a live Q&A. And the idea is we're going to run it as one of the gentry focus on webinars that we have monthly and then it will be available for everyone with the link and um, on our youtube channel both gentry and also on the emqn youtube channel so it will be made available to all participants and, and interested parties so part of that is we may not get through all of our questions today so we plan to um I invite you to submit any questions through the post-it sticky notes that are on the tables um, and we'll, as we said, we'll try hard to get through them today, but if not, we will have the, some written feedback and answers to the questions um, on the YouTube channel videos. So that means that we can actually get your answers, questions answered despite um, maybe us running out of time today. So I'm going to um, just very, very brief introduction with a, a big thank you um, both to the EMQN and GenQA teams, the EQA teams, these NIPT have been running for quite a few years now, and you're going to hear about how it's changed over the years. Um, and obviously, through COVID and all, all the work that's been going on in the background, it's still been delivered um, at a high standard. And obviously, a huge thank you as well to all our expert assessors, who we have a huge team now because we've got so many participating labs. And we're very pleased that we're joined today um, by Yannick from um, Radboon in the Netherlands and also Elizabeth Young from Birmingham in the UK and Elizabeth is going to join us virtually hopefully by team this time to us um, and so we have a hybrid meeting and then we have both um, Fiona and Veronica from the two EQA providers to help generate um, the Q&A live session answer any questions about any live meeting requests the um, presentations you've heard but also anything to do about the EQA schemes that you would always, always wanted to know. So I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to our first presenter. Yannick, I'm going to ask you to give us the advantages and pitfalls of NIP techniques. So thank you. Thank you. That, that's my thing. So, hi. Yeah, and my name is uh, Yannick Reis and I'm a clinical laboratory geneticist from Miami and the Hotels, UC. I've been working on NIPT for, for several years, setting up the Trident study within the Netherlands. And so, so I was invited to give a talk here and I'm sharing my experiences. And I have to say that, of course, we have one platform in the Netherlands, so I will mainly discuss this, but I will shortly talk about other platforms. So just so for DNA, I don't think I have to introduce this, but just a um, short introduction. So there is cell for DNA in the bloodstream of, the, of everyone, but we're talking about cell for DNA that comes from the placenta uh, and which is uh, floating around in the maternal blood. And uh, it is very important to, to know where the CF DNA is coming 
from that we're looking at. So it's coming from the outer shell of the uh, blastocyst, blastocyst. So it's the blue. I have a, I have a, so it's these blue cells, and those are the cells that we're looking at um, if we perform an IPT analysis. So the green one, the green cells, are developing the real fetus. So we're not looking at the, into fetal cells, and the, the and these um, orange cells, we're also not looking into if we perform an IPT. So this is very important to remember. Um, if you do a chorionic fillus test that most of you probably perform as well, then you have you do look at the same cells um, as when you perform an IPT analysis. Next slide. So if you uh, receive the maternal plasma, um, it's very important that you um, Spin it twice and separate it from the, the genomic DNA cells. And remember that approximately only 10% of this uh, cell free fetal DNA is from the fetus or from the placenta, and almost 90% is maternal. So, this is basically the trick that you have to deal with because you are analyzing um, DNA against a very high amount of. Maternal background DNA, and that's the yeah the trick that you have to deal with. Next um, slide, please. So this I got from um, from uh, Fiona, and what you see here is um, that um, most uh, participants are using the Pureset uh, platform from Illumina, and luckily <laughs> I'm using that as well. <laughs> so this is <laughs> where I know the most up, and I will mainly talk about this. And um, if you look at the other one, so there's a few labs uh, using Clarifo, there's a few labs using Harmony, and oh, this is not reported, so I can't talk about that. And, and there is some LBTs, so lab defense medicines, of course. So much for using that. Next slide, please. So if you look at the availability of NIPT tests in the field, this is just an example, it's, it's far from complete. But it's very important to know that there is a few tests that are performing whole genome next generation sequencing, but there's also a lot using targeted analysis. And then you can discriminate um, companies that are offering targeted sequencing, but there's also targeting arrays. And there is a, a rather new one, which is, I call it targeted nanofilter, but they use another kind of a technical platform to perform NIPT. So next slide. Oh no, no, sorry. Go on back. So this I just wanted to state that there is a few companies using SNPs, SNP information. And if you use SNP information, you have extra information about um, the maternal um, genotype. So you can um, analyze a few extra things. And these are the, the labs or the platforms that are using SNP information. So it's the Harmony, it's the Clarifo, and it's a, a Panorama test. And it's only targeted platforms that are using SNP information at the moment. Next slide, please. If you would like to do your own NIPC in the lab, there's um, a few mm -hmm. ones left. That you can see in this slide. So there's also a lot of companies that you have to send your sample to, and you can do your uh, reporting, but you cannot uh, perform it in in your own setup in your own lab. Next slide, please. This is the last slide about platform differences and points to consider. So if you would like to set up an IT within your own lab, I think there is four major things you have to uh, consider. So first of all, you have to find out what target you want to look at. Of course, everyone wants to look at freshman 21, freshman 18, and all tests, of course, offer those. But um, next to that, um, some labs would like to uh, analyze sex chromosomal aberrations. They want for they want to look at FRED, and DPD. For this, you do need the SNP information I was just talking about. Um, there is micro deletions you can or duplications you can analyze, but for that you need to sequence deeper. 
So that you, had, you need another click to do that. Um, and you can look at the full genome. For fetal fraction, there is a difference between the SNPs and the sequencing platforms. Um, if you have a SNP platform, they usually use the fetal fraction calculate. They, they use the maternal information that you can get out of the SNPs to calculate the fetal fraction. Um, but for sequencing nowadays, um, you can use fragment length. For that, you would need paradigm sequencing. You cannot use the single um, read sequencing. But uh, platforms are using this more and more. So you do get a better estimation of the fetal fraction nowadays than a few years ago. Performance, of course, all um, platforms state that they're the best um, platform. But I'm not going to tell you anything about that. But of course, you have to look at failure rates, specificity, sensitivity. And especially, I would like to say, please look at failure rate uh, because that of course has to do with your, the, the final costs in the, uh, uh, it will yeah it will uh, cost you um, infrastructure also a very important to consider your throughput if you have a fewer samples a week you may want to choose another platform then you have a lot of samples to start from of course costs turnaround time um, and whether the platform at all is uh, possible to set up in your own lab. Next slide, please. So now switching basically to whole genome sequencing. Um, so Parasec is using that, and there is, in, especially in Belgium, a lot of um, LDTs using this approach. Um, we also used to have our own LDT platform. So, um, the basic thing is that you use shallow genome sequencing. So that's why it is affordable. Deep sequencing for, for exome sequencing for point mutation detection is not necessary to perform NIPT. So you can use shallow 0.2x, 0.5x is enough to calculate the, the trisomies and the deletion applications. And you can use uh, a lot of different sequences, of course. This is just an example. So we used to use the high 4000, which is a machine nowadays, but we did do single read sequencing, which made it affordable. Um, very high throughput, because here you can run 128 samples for flow cell. So you need a high throughput. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to, to choose this kind of platform. Uh, this is the Ferisec solution at the moment. So they chose to have a smaller sequencer and they do do paradigm sequencing for this better. And this enables you to calculate fetal fraction because the the self of fetal DNA from the from the placenta is a little bit shorter than the self of fetal DNA that is in the bloodstream from other kind of sources. So it helps you to discriminate the the, 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 the placental DNA from the other types of self of fetal DNA. Next slide, please. So why would you need a dedicated bioinformatics tool? And I hope to convince you that it, this is very critical in an IT analysis. Next. And this is, of course, again, it, this is the reason. There's a lot of maternal noise, 90% against the 10% time of the people. Next slide. So this is a little complicated slide, but I just want you to remember uh, that in the beginning of NFT, a lot of uh, algorithms use the chromosome wide vesicle. And in that case, you can detect the trisomy 21, you can detect trisomy 13, no problem. But you cannot detect smaller aberrations. Um, and I will show you, even if you're not interested in detecting these smaller aberrations, why it is tricky to use the chromosome wide vesicle instead of a bin based vesicle. So causes of this prevent results we, we well so we call it false positive, false negative, but um yeah that I'll talk about that as well. But of course it is not uh, a technical false positive or false negative. It's usually uh, has a biological reason why it is false positive or false negative. And I will go through a few um, examples of this. So there is of course maternal copulum variation. If the, if the mother is carrying um, a, a 
the CMV can be harmless, then it may give you false positive and high PCR results. So you have to be aware of that and interpret this um, in the right way. There is maternal malignancies because if, if the, the cancer sheds um, tumor DNA in the bloodstream and there are stocking number changes in the tumor, they may um, also end up um, as a false positive and high PCR result. Maternal mosaics. So the mother can be perfectly healthy, but she's mosaic for a copy number variation. And you will detect this with NIPC. So you have to make sure that you recognize um, whether it's a maternal mosaic or whether it is um, a fetal TMD, or at least um, offer the, the, the right follow up for this kind of um, result. Then there is vanishing and discordant quiz. I think that will make sense because if you have two fetuses in the one, you have fetal DNA from both, and you can either get false positive and false negative and IPT results because of that. So you need a special algorithm to, to be able to detect this in the right way. Um, and the most common reason for uh, false positive and false negative and IPT results is the fetal and placental mosaics, which I um, will explain later. And a very logical reason for a false negative result is uh, a low feed infection. Next slide. So chromosomal mosaicism. This is um, a cartoon to explain. This is a generalized mosaicism. So it's a mosaic, mosaic both in the fetus and in the placenta. You will pick this up with NIPT if the mosaicism level is high enough. This is a, a CPM, a confined placenta mosaicism. So it's only there, it's, it's only a mosaic in the placenta and it's not in the fetus. And remember the cells that we analyzed with NIPT come, are coming from the placenta. So this will give you a false positive NIPT result. So you, that's why you always have to convert, convert your NIPT result with, a, with an invasive test. Otherwise you will, um, think the, the baby is not healthy and it may be healthy. So that's really not something you would like to report. And this is very and, and, and this is very common. So this is the major reason for false positive and IPT results. This is very rare, but it does exist and it's it's dangerous, of course, because this will give you a false negative and IPT. Um, you can't do anything about it, unfortunately. But you have to uh, remember if if you find out later that the baby was carrying a trisomy 21, for example, it is really always good to go back and do the right follow-up analysis to be sure your NFT result was correct and you did not mess up something in the lab, but it was a bio had a biological origin. Next slide. Okay, so a few examples. This is why we yeah um, advise to do follow-up thorough follow-up in certain cases. So this is um, an example of a West Blunder image. So this is our algorithm. Um, and what you see here is all the chromosomes, one to 20. So this chromosome one, this chromosome two. And what you see here, the purple bar, they state that it may be a trisomy two in this case. So what we reported was a trisomy, could be quite um, a trisomy two and we recommend it. Follow up on that. And next slide. So, what was performed was a fish, um, a karyotyping, and there was no evidence for cells with trisomy 2. So, we said it most likely was a CPM, so a confined placenta mosaic. But we did ask for placenta after birth because we did want to prove that, because this is not a very common CPM, the trisomy 2. Yes. So the oh yeah, just move on. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Something missing there. No, go back. I'll just make the story short <laughs> without slides, I guess. So what happened here? So the pregnancy went on because we did report a CPM, um, and during uh, ultrasound analysis during the pregnancy. Uh, there were um, aberrations detected 
in the channel. So finally, there was uh, an abortion because of the of Shankar Nanayat. And so after abortion, they really thought that he was just like a mosaic personality. So in this case, it was um, a mosaic personality within the people. So it was um, a false negative identity in this case. Okay, yeah, I don't know what to write down, but um, so it was a generalized placenta mosaic. So the rest, I don't know where it was. You, see, you, show, you show that uh, seems to be a trifle with 22, with, with two. Two or, or which kind of examination? By yes, by NRPP. So that's so in our mind. Right. So, so, okay. Yes, so the NRPP was, was positive. The NRPP was right. So, so it's not the false negative. No, exactly. No, I mean, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, it was, NRPP was right. It was false negative, um, carried by B. And um, the other one, yes, yeah. Yeah. Not the follow up was false negative. Not the false negative. No, NRPP was right. Yes. Next. So maternal CMV, I think um, all of you know nowadays, but this publication came out right after, so it was 2015. It um, appeared that it was a quite a good group, Jason the group, and they said, yeah, we have copy number creation and false positive prenatal and after two results. And it turned out that this had to do with the chromosome white red for analysis, as I said before. I hope the next slide is there. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there it is. So, can you imagine this is a normal uh, profile? Um, this is a trisomy 13 in this case. But if you have a maternal CMV right here on the, on the chromosome 30, it has a Z score up to 35. And if you would calculate the chromosome wide z-score instead of a bin z-score like we did here you can imagine that it the chromosome wide z-score may uh, come above the threshold of calling a threshold infection so then you will issue a false positive NIPT threshold infection in this case so this is really good to remember but I have to say that I think all algorithms are now doing it the right way but this is good to understand. Yes. So this is another one, just very good to remember if you're doing whole genome NIPT. So what you see here is chromosome 10, and it looks like there is a deletion at the end of chromosome 10. Um, in the beginning, we thought, oh, this is a piece of deletion, so I recorded it. And then there are more and more cases are coming up showed up with exactly the same terminal deletion within the Netherlands. So we investigated this further because we thought this can be real. Next slide, please. And it turned out that there is a fragile site in this area of chromosome 10. So this breaks now and then. So the, the mother is mosaic for this deletion and it's totally harmless. So you really mm -hmm. have to take care. If you see a deletion at 10Q, that is probably a harmless mosaic maternal deletion. So you should not report this as a fetal deletion. And um, this is an example of the, the vanishing and discordant twins I talked to you about, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but these are two publications you may want to read, especially this one, because this does uh, review um, screening methods. That, that, that tricks that you can learn from, from different um, platforms in twin analysis. Yes. And then if we go back to Pyrosec, I hope most of you are using Pyrosec and then this may be of help. So if you are using Pyrosec, you only look at the table, right? You do not get a picture like this. And this is what we um, are very happy with. We run both algorithms. So we run right under N Pyrosec. And if you have this picture, you see um, a nice deletion at chromosome 16, but it's only six megabases um, of size. So Pyrosec does not hold it because they have a threshold of seven megabases. And usually you wouldn't see this because the sensitivity is um, too low. 
But this appeared to be um, a maternal mosaic deletion, and that's why the Z score is low enough to pick it up with this average. And this uh, potentially appeared to be clinically relevant because the model was affected, meaning that the fetus can have the same deletion. So you want to report this as clinically relevant. Next one. So this is another example. So in this case, the, the request was targeted. So this pregnant lady only wanted to have chromosome 13, 18, 21 results. And no, it looked like a crescent 21 with West honor. It's clear. But Ferris Act failed by repeat. Um, and that gave the data out of range failure, meaning that we um, know that there is something going on on the other chromosomes that we're not looking at in this case. That's why periods are failing. But um, if you do not know that you, you can repeat it, you can repeat it several times, and periods like will say it's it's failed, it's failed, and so you cannot give an IPC report. But if you use another algorithm next to it, we can issue a report, and it's really advised to follow this up because probably there's much going on on the other chromosomes. Well, next one, I think. Yes, yeah, so this is also um, interesting. I think if you have a white thunder profile, you see a present eight. Normally, a present eight is very common CPM, so it's not from the fetus, it's only in the placenta. But you can see it's a very, it has a very high death score. For, it's probably maternal. And that's what we see in white thunder right away. But if you look at the table, the fear set gives you a plus eight. So you we would easily report, oh, it's a price in the eight, so maybe CPM. So you I'm not sure that you would advise to follow up, but sometimes they're not following this this price in the eight. But if you look, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can actually find it with uh fear set two, but then you have to go to the supplementary report. And it states here, you have to check here, the region mosaic ratio is 14, meaning that it's 14 times um, more than, it's a 14 times copy. And so this is not um, a fetal or a CPM. This is something in the mother. So you really want to report this differently than just your statement, it's a person you ate. I think this is it. I have only 15 minutes left. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, any questions? Please give us pop them down on the sticky notes that are going around so you don't forget or um, remember them and we'll come to them at the QA panel at the end. So, now I'm going to use the great powers of IT, hopefully, and my. <laughs> Young from the West um, Midlands Genomic um, Hospital and Genomic Medicine Service, based in Birmingham, in the UK. And um, Beth's going to hopefully. Um, yeah, she's there. Great. <laughs> Hi, Beth. Can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Welcome. What do you like about the Eurovision Hong Kong? <laughs> <laughs> Milk <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, everyone. I'm I'm so disappointed not to be there with you, but um here in sunny Birmingham. So um so I said my name's Beth Young. Sorry if we got feedback. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I think it's just reading back to me. Um my name's Beth Young and I'm a clinical scientist at the um, um genetic club here in Birmingham. Um and I oversee the NIPT service, which we've been offering um since to, um, 2015 now, gosh. So I just wanted to give you some example cases that um, how we deal with some of the challenges in an NHS lab that Yannick has so um, very nicely explained. So the first slide, if you could. So this lady was referred to us um, following a high chance result from her combined screen of one in seven for trisomy 21. 
um, and at scan she had no ultrasound findings. At this point it was very very early in our service and we were still sending our samples off to Illumina in San Diego um, and they returned a report which was somewhat surprising to say that um, a high chance of trisomy 18. Um, next slide please. So as recommended we went on um, and offered the woman an amnio which she had at 15 plus 3 um, our frontline test for this amnio would be um, QF-PCR and we saw no evidence of any trisomy 13, 18 or 21 by QF-PCR. At this point, this was the first um, discrepant result we'd had, so we may have gone a bit overboard in our follow-up, but I thought it was a nice case to present. We did both microarray and karyotype analysis on the DNA extracted from the amnio and again showed no evidence of imbalance. So at this point, because like I say, it was our first um, discrepant result, we did actually ask the lady for a repeat NIPT sample just to rule out a sample mix-up. And this was provided at 18 weeks gestation. And in just those few weeks between her two samples, we had started running the ha um, service in-house. So we tested using the Illumina Verify test and again, got a really strong, clear trisomy 18 result. Um, next slide, please. So we said um, that this discrepancy is likely to be due to confined placental mosaicism, which can be associated with placental insufficiency, although we couldn't completely exclude the possibility of low level mosaicism in other tissues and recommended that the pregnancy was carefully monitored. And we're very lucky that we're on the same site as our specialist fetal medicine centre. And so we asked them to send us a cord blood at delivery so we could follow this case up. Next slide, please. So the good news is that um, a healthy little girl was born at term, although she was a little bit small for gestational age, which is perhaps fitting with the um, placental insufficiency. Um, and we performed both chromosome and microanalysis on her cord blood sample and showed no evidence of an imbalance or rearrangement of chromosome 18. So that's great news, healthy baby girl. We were also lucky to get a placental sample and the QF-PCR analysis showed trisomy for just the markers on the P-arm of chromosome 18. And we also performed microarray analysis that confirmed this result as a gain of the short arm of chromosome 18. We also had parental blood samples, which showed no evidence of a predisposing balanced chromosomal rearrangement. And so next slide, please. We concluded that in this case, there was a partial trisomy 18 in the placenta um, that was likely to represent confined placental mosaicism, um, but that this cell line had arisen de novo and there's unlikely to be any risk of recurrence in future pregnancies. As I say, we did quite a lot of studies into this pregnancy because it was the first time we'd seen a discrepant result. I don't think anymore, especially with the numbers we're dealing, we would do this, but I just thought it shows really nicely how you can see that discrepant NIPT result with the, uh, the follow-up amnia. So moving on to case two, if I can. So this lady was referred to us at just over 13 weeks gestation due to an increased nuchal translucency and a combined screen result of one in five for trisomy 21. Again, we performed the Illumina Verify um, assay in-house and showed no evidence of any aneuploidy and reported the result as consistent with two copies of chromosomes 21, 18 and 13. So on the next slide, unfortunately, when this little girl was born, she had uh, clinical symptoms of Down syndrome with reduced tone, epicanthal folds and single palm accrease. Um, what I will say in the seven years of, deliver of delivering the NIPT service, this is the only false negative we've seen and we, so we did follow it up quite heavily which I would like to think we would always do if we had um, a discrepant result that way around. Um, a karyotype was performed on baby when she was three weeks old um, and we showed that there was a normal mosaic karyotype with 25 out of 30 cells examined having an additional chromosome 21 and 5 out of 30 cells being 46XX. So if we might go on to the next slide. This was obviously very disappointing for us. It's not a result you want to give. Um, so we did do a quite in-depth review of our data and also asked Illumina to review the data for us. Um, the Verify um, assay uses NCV or normalized chromosome values. And this, the value for this sample was clearly within the not detected range. And Illumina re um, reviewed the sequencing data and said there was absolutely no suspicion of increased chromosome 21 coverage and the fetal fraction was within the normal range. Obviously um, with a Previous case, we asked for a repeat sample. That wasn't possible here, but we did go back to a second aliquot of plasma from the original sample that we banked and got the same result. And so we concluded that in this case, sadly, there was um, a trisomy 21 cell line that was either low level mosaic or not present at all in the cytotrophoblastic cells of the placenta. And we wrote a letter to the clinician um, explaining how this result might have come about. 
Um, next slide. Um, the third case I want to show you was one, um, this scenario we've seen a few times now. So in this particular case, the lady was um, referred to as quite late in pregnancy, at 21, well, nearly 22 weeks, because she'd missed her screening appointments. Um, baby had no obvious scan abnormalities, but they were using NIPT as a frontline screen for her. And in her sample, we saw multiple aneuploidies detected, both trying to so be 13 and 21. And we actually ran the sample several times to just uh, make sure and we got the same result three times over. Um, again, I think we've seen this more often now, so if we saw it once, we wouldn't bother repeating, but this was just the first time. We'll move on to the next slide. Um, we we're a bit careful about how we reported this result because it was unexpected to see multiple trisomies. But we did say um, that it was increased representation of chromosomes in 13 and 21, indicating a high risk of trisomy for these chromosomes, no evidence of trisomy for chromosome 18, and recommended that the patient had an amnio. We also recommended that the um, detailed ultrasound scans were performed, um, in particular looking for any abnormalities, and also confirmation that this was a signal to pregnancy and that we weren't seeing this dual um, anomaly due to um, an additional sac or a demise twin. And we also highlighted in the report that this is a screening test and false positives and false negatives can occur. Now, if we go to the next slide, the lady went on to have um, an amnio and QFPCR showed um, trisomy 21 with no evidence of trisomy 13. Um, it performed a carry type on the sample which showed free trisomy 21. The lady went on to her terminate the pregnancy. We had unfortunately no further follow-up material but we've um, assumed that there was a trisomy 13 cell line that was confined to the placenta. So here in the placenta, we've seen both presidents of 13 and 21, but the 13 was just restricted to the placenta, whereas the trisomy 21 was in both fetus and placenta. Um, if we can go to the next slide, slide four. This lady was referred to as at 15 weeks. She had an increased chance result for trisomy 21 from her combined screen of one in 72. But the reason, particularly the, um, her obstetricians went for NIPT is because she was seriously ill with sepsis. And so they wanted to reduce the risk um, of to the fetus of infection. And this, as an aside, is quite interesting. We've had a couple of cases like this, um, more notably with ladies who were HIV positive, where the obstetricians wanted to reduce the risk of um, vertical transmission of an infection. And so we'd be using NIPT instead of an invasive test. If we go on to the next slide. Um, again, using Illumina Verify, the NIPT result showed what was described as a chaotic trace, so multiple aneuploidies and monopo monosomies, and trisomies and monosomies, sorry. And we reported this result has failed, but because of this very interesting result, we did follow it up with her um, clinicians. And sadly, the lady was later um, point di um, diagnosed with a, a kidney tumour. And, and so this is, I recommend if you've not had a chance to read this paper by the Dutch NIPT consortium that recently came out of the Journal of Clinical Oncology, again, talking about how NIPT results um, can sometimes be indicative of a maternal malignancy. But I think this was a nice um, summary of how that happened for this lady. And if we go into the next slide, this is my last case. And this isn't actually one we've done here in Birmingham. It was, um, this data was provided by uh, my colleagues in TDL Genetics for us. Is an interesting scenario I'd like to share. The lady, it was a private referral at 11 weeks for maternal request and TDL perform NIPT using the Harmony assay. Uh, this case was reported as low probability for trisomy 21, 18 and 13 and a female, female fetus, but no sex chromosome aneuploidy was requested, so this wasn't performed at this time. So we're going to the next slide. Um, the obstetrician came back at 20 weeks to say um, to check the result because um, scans had shown that the fetus hadn't um, male genitalia. Um, an amnio was performed, which showed a 47XYY carrier type. And so at this point, the NIPT data was reanalyzed for sex chromosome aneuploidy, and it showed a high probability for monosomy X. If we go into the next slide. Now it's known that fetal um, sex discrepancy between NIPT and either ultrasound invasive testing or at birth is seen in fairly rarely, but between one in 1,500 to 2,000 pregnancies. And causes for this, again, as with some of the other discrepant results, can include low fetal um, cell pre-DNA, co-twin demise, maternal transplant, maternal X chromosome variant, placenta mosaicism and laboratory error. Um, in this case, the lab were able to rule out laboratory error by retesting. And they considered that the, um, the, the possibility, the probability between the monosomy X NIPT result and an XYY carry type on the amnio 
would indicate placental mosaicism due to an equal cell division in a 46XY zygote. And we felt that this information added to documented evidence that placental mosaicism can lead to discrepant NIPT results. Um, and just the last, last slide, this is the schematic of how they proposed this um, event had come about. So this results was um, consistent with origin and discordance in early mitotic area, er, early mitotic error, apologies, arising from a 46 XY zygote. Um, they did say that they couldn't rule out the possibility of undetected mosaicism indicating an alternative origin event though. And this information together adds to the basis for a lower um, PPV for monosomy X, which is currently reported to be about 50% and really, really highlights the need for careful post-test counselling, um, especially around sex chromosome results. So I just wanted to finish off on the last two slides with some reporting considerations that I think these cases really brought home to us. Although NIPT is a very high performing screening test, false positives and false negatives can occur. So it's really important the results are reported as a risk or a chance and not diagnostic. So we should avoid using phrases such as trisomy 21 detected, we should also avoid using terms positive and negative. And a, a follow-up diagnostic testing of a high chance result should always be offered to the patient to confirm the result. And it's also um, important to should consider how genetic counselling might be used, but this is often dependent on local policy. And as my final slide, things that um, we've considered, we've discussed between ourselves as assessors, assessors as things that are really important to including your NIPT report. The NIPT should contain a clear, concise summary statement. It should also contain details of the test methodology and the details of test limitations. In particular, the sensitivity and specificity of the assay, the fact that it won't cover other genetic anomalies and so make it clear what NIPT is and isn't looking for, and also the risk that biological factors can affect the interpretation results. And this isn't limited to, but probably most noticeably, vanishing twin, um, twin multiple pregnancies and gestational age validation information. And I think that was all mine, so just to acknowledge everybody who's very kindly provided data for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I think it's just illustrative that the, getting the test in and the right results is almost half of the challenge. It's about how you report that and retrieve mm -hmm. the right information from the clinical team, isn't it? So absolutely. Happy, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, Beth, are you happy to hang on with us and see whether to do the QA after the today presentation? Absolutely, I'll be here till the end. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so we move on now to um, my colleague Steve Bromica. We're going to do a nice double act. So, Bromica mm -hmm. from EMQM. And then Fiona's going to follow on from Jane Craig. So we'll go to you then, please. And we will be very brief because, A, you all participate in the QA, so I'm sure you know best uh, what it is that we are doing and what it is that you are doing. Great. And B, because, yes, we need to move on to the QA. Um, so, yes, I will start talking. Uh, talking to you about extra quality assessment in NIPT and as my colleague is going to talk about the actual NIPT QA that we've been running for a couple of years now. So the first consideration is why does it really matter for you to participate in any QA? And the main reason for that really is uh, because this is an external me measure of the quality of your service and doing so may highlight any issues with it or methodologies and uh, in doing so may prevent some future errors in your diagnostic services. Us as EQA providers are committed to provide continuous education and training. So if you if you come across any issues uh, or problems, you can always come to us, and we will do our best to help you solve them. Uh, and uh, least but not uh, last but not least, and very unromantically, performance monitor is required for accreditation. So participating in our EQAs uh, ensures that that you can maintain your accreditation, as well as uh, taking into account that the regulators do look at the EQA performance and they can sometimes suspend the testing activity if a laboratory is a persistent top performer. Um, so our next few slides are just me trying to illustrate to you the differences in how what you see and what we see when we are talking about EQA. So for, for the participating laboratories, you see a sample arriving in your laboratory and then Maybe six more six months later, you see the results that, uh, that you will receive for your EQA performance. Whilst for us, 
<laughs> well, but the whole process takes more about and more like 18 months. We have to first start to work on draft papers. We need to store the material and we need to uh, complete the validation of the material. Then we need to physically prepare the other ports, uh, collect your registrations, and then prepare the scheme paperwork, and then only then send your samples out to yourselves. Um, afterwards, we'll also collect the reports that you're providing, uh, but we have to organize all the marking and assessment uh, in the meantime. And that reminds me, uh, we're always on the lookout for assessors. So if you're interested in being a UPA assessor, uh, please come to us after this talk or at any point and, and, and apply to become an, an IPP assessor. And we're always welcoming new faces. Um, so this was partially covered by actually our fantastic talks already, but this is just to drive home what are your considerations in a UQA. So we need to make sure that the scope of the test that you're performing is sufficient and is properly described in your report. Uh, we want to always know what the sensitivity and specificity of the test is when you are performing it, not necessarily when the manufacturer design, is designing it. Um, we have to look at whether um, you have adequately reported the limitations of the test. And this is something that has been proven time and time again an issue because people don't tend to put limitations of the test as much as we would like them to. Uh, and we want to see the, uh, report, uh, the adequacy of the sample for the test, for example, mentioning of the heat or fraction. And finally, uh, that was actually just mentioned by Beth, is how we wanted to see the results be reported. We would like us you to report the results for all the test performance, uh, for example, ensuring that you're reporting normal results for chromosomes 13 18 when you are when there's a high risk of chromosome 21, for example. Um, do not uh, report any unreported uh, unexpected testing. And as Beth said, please avoid using the terms negative and positive and instead state the risk or a chance of a trisome. And on that note, so um, I'm Kieran Morgan and I'm with Jane Tui and I thought at this point it would be quite good to just give a summary of the story so far um, with regards to the NIPT EQAs that we offer in the collaboration. So back in 2010 to 2012 we started doing pre preliminary pilots and we came to Stanford Dawson's Develop Studies etc. And the first NIPT EQA was offered in 2013 and this was NIPT for people sex in. And then in 2017, we introduced NIPT for common aneuploidies and separately we offered um, NIPT for mental deletions. And 2020, we redesigned and sort of reinvented the EQAs as they stood. So at this point, we introduced um, sex chromosome aneuploidies to the common aneuploidies. We introduced determination of fetal sex and we redesigned the fetal sex in EQA so that it mirrored the clinical setting for an early fetal, um, fetal test. So as I say, NFPT for fetal sex was established in 2013, and since then our participation has more than doubled, and this has proven to be um, an EQA which produces very high standard results in very successful EQA. And as I said, in 2020, we slightly adapted the EQA so that it mirrors the clinical service. For example, where there's a known sex linked um, molecular genetic disorder in the family, and actually an early result is pertinent to, to the family's the case. Um, and in the last four years, we've actually not had any fifth final players. So that shows that we're doing our job right and the participants are also doing their job right, which is great. Next slide, please. The NIPT for common aneuploidies was established in 2017 and we now have about 140 um, participants worldwide. Again, a very successful EQA and 95% of our participants on average get a satisfactory performance. And as I described, with a slight change where we introduced um, sex chromosome aneuploidies to this EQA in 2020, we did see a slight increase in the um, level of poor performers. So there was a slight jump from 5% to almost 9%. And when we looked into this, um, this was a validated result in case two of an XYY, which has been um, brought to the attention previously in the presentation. Within the poor performers, two actually reported the result as trisomy 13. So as a result of EQA, we've identified areas where these labs actually had a sample swap error or a data input error which is something that can happen in the lab, but could have possibly gone unnoticed if they hadn't been participating 
in this EQA, and the remaining 7% of the participants incorrectly reported a low risk result for XYY and employee group. Um, we did a, an audit on the, um, the platforms and the tests that were used, and there was no, um, no one platform that was shown an increased link to this error uh, this result. So, next slide, please. So, just to summarise, across the board, our NIPT EQAs have highlighted lots of areas over the years where there's a need for improved reporting across both NIPT for common employees and for protosepsin. And again, just to drive home the message that in the result, we're looking for a clear result. We want reports for all the tests that have been performed, include your test limitations, referrals for follow-on testing and genetic counselling where appropriate, um, avoid over-interpretation of chromosome numbers, and remember that there's only specific chromosomes that we're looking at, and NIPT, and again, EQ can often highlight where terminology is misleading and we can provide um, education and corrective information in our EQ summary reports. So at this point, a quick, after a quick whiz through, I think we'll open the floor to questions if we have any.